and I'll pray for our time. God, thank you that you are greater than we are, that you dwell in the heavens and that you do all that pleases you. God, it's so humbling to think about the generosity and graciousness of your own will, where you can, where you do have all power at your disposal to do absolutely anything you desire to do. You have chosen to leverage your power for our good by speaking to us, by saving those whom you've called, by continuing to use us despite our weaknesses and imperfections. These things truly are graces that we do not deserve, uh, for which we could never repay you, certainly. And what a privilege it is to be a member of your household, that you have adopted us through Christ, in Christ. You have called us your own. You have made us your children, even your slaves and slaves of righteousness, that we can have minds that agree with you, that our hearts, amen, what you say is true. Even when it speaks ill of us, uh, we heartily amen your word. I pray that this morning you would help us to see clearly what your word says, we know that we have no wisdom apart from what you've spoken. We have no idea what is just or what is right or what is true. Even those things you've implanted on our hearts that we know instinctively, uh, we still do not see them as clearly as we ought to apart from your word. And so... Thank you. Thank you for speaking to us so clearly, so sufficiently and powerfully. We pray that you would use your word in our lives this morning to transform us, make us look more like your son. We know that our conformity to Christ's image is our joy, ultimately, that is our ultimate good. And we don't do you any more service than when we look most like your son, when we walk as he walked. And so we pray that your word would be a tool used by you this morning to equip us to do just that, that we could walk more faithfully in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. I want you this morning to consider the nature of the Bible. God's word is powerful. God's word is authoritative. God's word is right and true and perfect. The scriptures are infallible, inerrant, sufficient, wise, and profitable. And we could ha add a host of other attributes to this list to describe all of the things that God's word most certainly is. In thinking about those things that I just mentioned, we would not likely think about these qualities from any sort of subjective viewpoint. In other words, when it comes to the power of God's word or the infallibility of God's word or the authority of God's word, we would never, I hope, ask the question, well, does it seem powerful to me? If we were wanting to know if God's word was authoritative, I hope we would never ask, 
does it sound authoritative to me? Or in answering the question, is it sufficient? Hopefully we would not seek to answer that question and arrive at the truth of that question by asking, does God's word feel sufficient to me? Those would seem rather simple. But oftentimes, Christians put the clarity of God's word into a different category. Is God's word clear? At this question, we might be reluctant to give a straightforward, yes, absolutely, it is clear. When it comes to the clarity of Scripture, we seem to be more ready to think of this particular quality of God's word from our own vantage point. Does it seem clear to me? And there's just no need to do that. This ought not be the case when we consider the nature of the Bible. All that God's word is, it is apart from us. Everything that is true about God's word is true of God's word independent of us. How we think about it, how we feel about it, how it seems to us. And this is very good news, as you know. God's word is trustworthy even when we are faithless. God's word is good even when we are evil. It is powerful when we are weak. It is wise when we are foolish. It is right when we are wrong. But if God's word is objectively clear, if it is perspicuous, as we recently discussed, then why do we fail to see it clearly? Why do we fail to see it clearly if it is so clear? What prevents us and functions as barriers to the pers perspicuity of God's word? One reformer, William Whitaker, in the 16th century, uh, writing a defense of the scriptures, uh, against two of the, the foremost Catholic apologists of the day. William Whitaker said, the subjects of Scripture are indeed obscure, hidden, abstruse, and mysterious, yet not in themselves, but to us. All difficulty, therefore, if difficulty there be, in things is ours and springs from ourselves. So you can see there he's making the distinction between the objective clarity of God's word and our subjective lack of clarity. And so this morning, what I want to try to do is tackle uh, something of an addendum to the Blood for Clarity series. This is an important addendum. And discuss what are the things that prevent us from having clarity when we read our Bibles. When you study the scriptures, when you uh, perhaps wake up in the morning, sleepy-eyed, with a hot cup of coffee, to Ezekiel, as I've been doing for some weeks now, why does Ezekiel seem unclear to us in other portions of scriptures? And I have six reasons to answer that question this morning. Six barriers to the clarity of God's word. Just to give you a heads up at the beginning, these begin with what would uh, be in, considered sinful. <laughs> these start with more sinister reasons and then move to what are more innocent and not so, so much sinful reasons. But just to begin, barrier number one of these six barriers to the clarity of God's word is probably the foremost barrier to understanding God's word and seeing it clearly, and that is unbelief. Unbelief. Unbelief prevents us 
from seeing God's word clearly. The objective clarity of God's word is impeded when it is met by our own unbelief. Turn to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, two things are undeniably clear in this passage. And that is Jesus' teaching on belief and faith, as well as the confusion of the people at Jesus' teaching. They cannot see clearly what Jesus is clearly speaking, clearly teaching. As he is preaching to them and teaching them about himself, what is required for eternal life, that all that is necessary for these wayward people with wrong motives is for them to humbly submit to him in faith. They must believe him and his words. And then all of their confusion about what he's teaching would be done away with. Verse 26 in John 6, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. This is after he's fed the 5,000. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal." Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so still pushing for a free meal, verse 30, they respond, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? As if the work that he has just done on the other side of the lake before he escaped them wasn't good enough. He has just fed 5,000 men plus women and children. And they were so convinced by this sign that they wanted to take him and make him king. He eluded them, prevented them from doing this. And so this is not a sincere objection to what Jesus has been teaching. He's already given them sufficient reason to believe in him. This is wrongly motivated people coming to Jesus, not wanting to believe in him sincerely, but merely wanting the benefits of following him as his disciples. Jump down to verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. So clearly the issue that Jesus understands these people, he understands that the issue is one of faith. He calls himself the bread of life, and he carries out that metaphor throughout the rest of this passage. And the two things he is requiring of this insincere crowd is to come to him, according to verse 35, and believe in him as the bread of life, to come to him, the bread of life, to believe in Jesus, the bread of life, is to not hunger, never thirst. And so he picks up on this hunger and thirst language all throughout the rest of the passage in place of coming to him and believing in him. This is lost completely on the crowd because from here moving forward, they are absolutely confused about what he's saying. As unbelievers, in their unbelief and insincerity, they cannot clearly understand what Jesus is teaching them. 
he goes on. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son, and here it is again, believes in him, will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. You can see their discontentment with his answers, verse 41. They're grumbling because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Fast forward and jump down to Uh, just further in the in this passage, uh, verse 59. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, when they heard this said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious of that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. That is Jesus' diagnosis of their confusion. The problem is not that Jesus himself has been unclear. The problem is that they refuse to believe him. A similar scene occurs in John chapter 8. Flip over to John chapter 8. And in kindness, where Jesus is encountering a similar hardness of heart that was always characteristic of the Jews, straightforwardly tells them what their problem is. Verse 43. Why do you not understand what I am saying? <laughs> it is because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I speak truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. That is by faith, they are not of God. They have not been born of God. And so the reason they don't believe is because they're not of God. The reason, verse 43, they don't understand is because they don't believe. They can't stand to hear what Jesus is saying. And so because of that hardness of heart, they lack understanding. This is obviously true of all unbelievers. Unbelievers can't understand, truly understand God's word. And oftentimes the clarity of God's word is obscured because it is met by a hard heart and unbelief. At times, though, believers can also fall into this same pitfall. Um, we categorically believe that is true of every believer, obviously. That's what makes them believers. They believe God. They believe the gospel. They have been transformed and rescued by God, by faith. But we still have lingering unbelief, do we not? For starters, just failing to believe that the scriptures are clear would be one area of unbelief that we can fall prey to pretty easily. Just failing to believe that God's scriptures are objectively clear before we even read them, bringing to the text a presupposition 
that I, everything in, in this book isn't clear and putting the blame on the scriptures rather than the difficulty on ourselves. Well, the one who doubts scripture's clarity, the one who does not believe scripture's clarity will rarely be disappointed. You believe scriptures aren't clear? Then you'll probably find out when you read them by experience, yeah, they're not clear. You'll, you'll be affirmed in your unbelief. By contrast, if you assume that the scriptures are clear, and if you assume that you don't understand for some reason that exists in yourself and not in the scriptures, then that gives you all the hope to draw nearer to the scriptures and just continue reading them, continue uh, studying them until you gain the subjective clarity that God's word objectively possesses. We should come to the scriptures with that presupposition that they're perfectly clear even if I don't understand. A good example of this is the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. So just flip back a little bit to Luke 24. These two disciples walking to Emmaus are grieved because they didn't didn't understand that what God said about the Messiah's death before he comes to reign in Jerusalem, he has to die and suffer as the, the servant predicted in the Old Testament. And they just were lacking understanding. Jesus diagnoses their problem in verse 25, similar to what we saw in John 8. And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Because they weren't believing in everything that the Old Testament said, they were, according to Jesus, foolish for doing so. And this was his diagnosis of their grief and confusion. Verse 26, was it not necessary you have to love, you love how just Christ says it. Didn't you know? Of course. Wasn't it absolutely necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory? Didn't you read your Old Testament? Why don't you believe the Old Testament? And so he, verse 27, does exactly what they need. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. Notice that what they needed to have clarity was not something other or outside of the scriptures. They were doubting the scriptures, didn't have the clarity that they needed from the scriptures, and so Jesus didn't turn to Scholars outside of scriptures, other authorities, he just opened the scriptures with them again and explained to them what the scriptures clearly said. And then the result of him doing this, they say in verse 33, they said to one, uh, 32, excuse me, they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? They got it. They gained clarity from the scriptures. And in this moment, Psalm 119, verse 130, was happening. The unfolding of your words gives light. So Jesus unfolded the words for them of the scriptures, and they gained clarity. Beyond unbelief, there's another barrier to the clarity of God's word, and that is various kinds of sins. Just sin in general will prevent you from seeing the scriptures clearly. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, 
in describing the word that caused new birth in Peter's audience and in calling them to long for this pure milk of the word by which they were born again. He's giving a command to them about their desires, <laughs> long for the pure milk of the word, verse 2. There is something that must happen in conjunction with this longing. If his audience is going to obey this command and effectively direct their desires toward the word, there is something else that they must be practicing. What is it? Verse 1 of 1 Peter 2. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, then, verse 2, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. These two things must go together. A longing for the pure milk of the word cannot happen without a putting aside of various kinds of sin. To say it a different way, if you don't put aside sin, known sin, sin that God has revealed to you, then you have no hope of truly desiring God's word. Have you been in a dry season lately where you just don't see a, a thirst for God's word that you want? Consider, what, is there any sin in my life that I'm not putting away? Is there, are there sins that I'm holding on to? Some lust or craving that I'm unwilling to relinquish? A, a, a relationship I'm not willing to reconcile? Forgiveness I'm not willing to extend? Hidden sin that I'm not willing to give up? Greed that I'm enjoying? and not ready to let go of. Diagnose your life. Diagnose your heart so that you can desire God's word as we're required to. Again, William Whitaker said, they who bring with them profane minds to the reading of the scriptures lose their trouble and oil. Those only read with advantage who bring with them pure and holy minds. Let me just highlight from Proverbs one sin that if you do not put off will impede your ability to clearly see what's in the scriptures. Turn to Proverbs 2. It is the sin of laziness. If we don't put off laziness, then we will fail to benefit from scripture as we ought to. It will not, we will not benefit from its clarity. In verse 5, and we've looked at this many times, but in verse 5, when Solomon says, then you will understand the fear of the Lord, the fear of Yahweh, and find the knowledge of God, there's a, that's subsequent to something else. Before you can gain understanding, before you can find knowledge, before you can obtain these things, you must first, verse 1, receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding. Yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand and find the knowledge of. These things imply diligence. They imply hard work to just look at the things that are, are mentioned, it's, it's hard work to continually make your ear attentive to wisdom, to in, continually incline your heart to understanding, to, to practice over time calling out for insight, raising your voice for understanding. And then verse 4, to seek it and search for it as for hidden treasures. 
They're hidden treasures. Beneath the surface, not laying on top of the ground. That would make them common and not treasures. Howard Hendricks said, the Bible does not yield its fruit to the lazy. That's true. And so if we embrace in our lives lives a love of comfort, just think of the, the work you would be unwilling to do when it comes to understanding God's word, if you love comfort more than diligence, if you love rest and relaxation more than discipline. Man, it's, it's hard work to train myself to get up early, to get in God's word, to labor over God's word over time. That's hard work. And that doesn't sound like fun to the person who loves comfort. And so the blessing that God has for you on the other side of diligence, on the other side of discipline and labor, you will never arrive at. You will never see those blessings because of an unwillingness to have them through discipline, labor, and diligence. In this same passage, we see a third barrier in Proverbs 2. And that's prayerlessness. Verse 3 just says, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding. Maybe sometimes we don't see the clarity of Scripture because we haven't asked for it. We've been self-reliant, self-dependent, independent. And so Scripture doesn't yield its, its fruit to us simply because we haven't asked. Prayerlessness, this kind of prayerlessness is really a symptom of arrogant self-reliance in us. Uh, We come to God's word thinking that nothing more than our own intellect is necessary for understanding. And so we assume that we are sufficient in ourselves rather than depending on God. Arthur Pink in the uh, book of the month in, in the sovereignty of God, he says this, there's a great chapter in there on prayer and how uh, prayer relates to God's sovereignty. He says, prayer redounds to God's glory for in prayer we do but acknowledge our dependency upon him. When we humbly supplicate the divine being, we cast ourselves upon his power and his mercy. In seeking blessings from God, we own that he is the author and fountain of every good and perfect gift. That prayer brings glory to God is further seen from the fact that prayer calls faith into exercise and nothing from us is so honoring and pleasing to him as the confidence of our hearts. It would greatly please God and does greatly please God when we open our Bibles and acknowledge Before diving in, God, I absolutely need you to give me understanding. Even on this side of conversion, we are equally dependent on God every moment to understand his words. Now, with a new regenerate heart, as we were before, we responded to the word the very first time. We are dependent completely on God to understand his word by faith. And so if we understand this dependence, then it pleases God to acknowledge it by calling out to him for insight. And just think about the connection between doing that and glorifying God. When you just start your time in God's word by acknowledging and regularly seeking dependently uh, his help for wisdom and insight and clarity, then when you actually have that prayer answered, and you gain clarity, then where does the glory go? It goes to him. That's an answer to prayer. I see this passage clearly. Praise God. Not praise be to me. If I haven't been seeking clarity, then it doesn't even occur to me when I finally do understand that I had help getting there. And so if we are self-reliant, not seeking for the glory to go to God, in our Bible reading, in our 
intake of Scripture, then it should be no wonder to us that we don't see more clearly. God is not sharing his glory with anyone else. And so if we are intending our own glory when we open up the Scriptures, then often God will not yield its fruit to us. God does not avail the blessings of the scriptures to those who intend their own glory in searching them. Uh, Jesus said that in John 5 to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them, that is in what you do with them, there's eternal life. And so they failed constantly to understand the scriptures that they themselves were searching because they were seeking their own glory in searching them. So they didn't understand them. God is eager for us to understand the scriptures. When we ask God for understanding, we are not asking a God who's reluctant, but we're asking God who's willing. And if we desire to understand for God's glory, then we will certainly have that prayer answered, have that desire fulfilled. One commentator said, when we can truly plead that our cause is God's own cause, We need never fear the want of success in prayer, though the answer may for a while be delayed. So make God's intention in your searching the scriptures, namely his own glory, make that your own aim. And you can look forward to an answer to that prayer. Barrier number four is ignorance. This is less sinister than some of the ones that we've already seen. Just ignorance and unawareness uh, that might be for a variety of reasons, things that you don't know. This could be due to not having read enough scripture yet, and so some parts of scripture seem unclear. Or it could be due to not having spent enough time in a specific passage. You ever had that happen? You're on your 10th Bible reading plan to read the Bible in a year and then you come to a passage that's been confusing to you but because of the times that you've read that same passage over and over and over and over and over again oh man I think I actually understand what that's saying now that makes way more sense than it did 10 years ago when I read it the first time we could still have lingering ignorance Uh, due to not having understood other doctrines or passages or principles from Scripture. And so as we gain clarity in one area, then other parts of the Bible start to make more sense, gain a cohesiveness, because I've grown in this doctrine. That's possible. It could also, just thinking of, of Hebrews 5 and that audience's dullness of hearing, we could still be ignorant, uh, ignorant due to not having practiced obedience in a particular area enough. God's been uh, teaching me over here in this area, and because I've not yet yielded in this area, well, he's just not giving me clarity in another area. The uh, elders of Israel in Ezekiel's day are like that. They come to Ezekiel saying, hey, we want a a word from God. And you know what God tells them? The same thing that he had been saying before. Nope, no new revelation for you. Go obey what I already said to you through Moses. Go put away the idols, go tear down the high places, and then come hear a new word from me, from me. And so perhaps God doesn't yield, um, and we still find ourselves being Uh, ignorant of certain things just because we haven't put on obedience in another area at times. And then sometimes we're just lacking knowledge of some crucial component to the context of the scriptures that we're reading. Um, Where is Kiriath-Jerim? You read about the land, and I don't know what Kiriath-Jerim is. So this passage, I don't understand the significance of this passage because I don't know where that place is on the map. Or I don't remember who that character in the Bible is. 
And so I don't realize the significance of the promises that are being made in a, in a further passage of Scripture because I don't remember what came before it. Who's Abraham? They keep talking about Abraham. He must be a big deal. And so you need to not be ignorant of certain things to understand further revelation. Um, you could be ignorant of the author, the audience, a cultural detail, geography. Those things could obscure what's clearly articulated in the scriptures. In Acts 8, there's a, this is an interesting example. In Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch doesn't understand until he had uh, a teacher sent to him by God, uh, that teacher being Philip. This man has a scroll of Isaiah. He's reading it, and he just does not understand what did he need? He needed a teacher. And he, he says that in verses 30 and 31 uh, of Acts 8. Verse 30, Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now, the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. Talk about a softball in evangelism. <laughs> He's reading Isaiah 53. And doesn't understand. So, his question, particularly verse 34 to Philip, he says, Tell me, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. I hope we can do that. Somebody, what does this mean in Isaiah 53? You can preach the gospel from Isaiah 53. And so he lacked understanding until God gave him a teacher. This should be encouragement to us to just keep reading the Bible. Keep putting yourself under sound biblical instruction because clarity is attainable because God has spoken clearly. And so we should just keep laboring in biblical, in receiving biblical instruction, in reading our Bibles ourselves. And we can expect God eventually to give us the clarity we seek. Barrier number five, difficulty. Difficulty is another barrier to the clarity of God's word. It's just hard. We don't see clearly because it's hard to understand at times. And we talked about in the second lesson of the Blood for Clarity series that this difficulty is or should be expected. The scriptures are God opening up his mind to us, giving, a, giving us a glimpse into the infinite, deep mind of God. Should we really expect everything to come easy? When things come easy, that's a grace of God, that all of his profundity and depth at times are really simple to us. But we should expect to encounter difficulty because this is the very mind of God communicated in language that we can understand. Second Peter, Peter the apostle acknowledged that what was written even in the New Testament at times was difficult, difficult to understand. Peter says in Second Peter 3, and you'll be encouraged if you've ever been unclear about what Paul is saying. First Peter, or excuse me, 2 Peter 3, 14, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. 
just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, to their own destruction. He acknowledges in what Paul has also written about the same things Peter's writing about. Paul's articulation of these truths, there's been things hard to understand. So be encouraged. Peter found them hard too. This isn't any commentary on the clarity of Scripture, obviously, because he's not saying that they're unclear. He doesn't say anything about Paul's confusion. Paul wasn't confused. He was just difficult to understand. Why must God's word at times be so difficult? We've already talked about because it's deep, we're getting a glimpse into God's mind. In uh, that same book written by William Whitaker, he quotes Gregory the Great, uh, a church father, uh, who says this. He comments on the uh, difficulty of Scripture, acknowledging that we don't always see it clearly, and he calls that obscurity. And so he says, the very obscurity of the words of God is of great use because it exercises the perception so as to be enlarged by labor and to, through exercise be enabled to catch that which a lazy reader cannot. It hath besides this still greater advantage that the meaning of the sacred scripture, which would be lightly, lightly esteemed if it were plain in all places, it, it, in some obscure places, the sweetness with which it refreshes the mind when found is proportionate to the toil and labor which were expended upon the search. Does that make sense? The difficulty when the person is willing to labor, there's a commensurate sweetness that they feel when they finally arrive at understanding because it was so hard. And then Whitaker adds, after quoting that, nothing could be said more truly. We confess with Gregory that there are many obscurities in Scripture and that this hath happened through the divine wisdom, partly to exercise us in Scripture, partly to prevent its being despised, partly that the truth when discovered might give us greater pleasure. When I, when I read that, I thought of um, the ladies who, who recently put together the James study. Some of you are, are taking that class. I mean, just years of laboring with Josh to put together an encouraging, robust study in the book of James for our church. I mean, you know, the, the husbands of the wives who are taking that study are looking at that binder like, wow, when can I take that study? <laughs> the, the fruit that's going to be yielded, not only from the uh, ladies who are taking that class and working hard to mine the book of James, but also uh, Sarah and Chris Evans and Josh who labored in James to put that together. How sweet is James to them now? So difficulty serves us as believers because it increases the sweetness of Scripture once we arrive at understanding. Finally, the, the, the last barrier that we'll discuss is God himself, providence. Barrier number six is providence. In God's providence, you, I, have difficulty in understanding the scriptures because God intends us, at least for a time, to lack clarity. Just think of the various elements over which God has been sovereign, 
that due to no fault of our own, really, the scriptures are more difficult to understand, seem less clear to us than it did to the original audiences. Let me just give you a few things to, uh, to consider in this regard. Providentially, God has created each of us differently. God has just created us differently. Some of us are more linguistically inclined. And so you enjoy sentence diagramming and grammar and syntax. I know it's a very small portion of you, but there's some of you who do enjoy those things. And so a deep study of scripture in those ways is, is really enjoyable to you and you just take to it. God hasn't created everybody that way. And so to get at the grammar of a passage that will give us understanding of it is more of an uphill battle for some. Well, God's just created us differently, and some are more inclined toward language, and some aren't. God's created uh, some of us with physical infirmities that impede or prevent us from studying long periods of time or uh, some of you even reading is a chore. So you have to find other creative ways to engage with God's word. You listen to it. You read uh, in spurts uh, because you have a physical infirmity where you can't even sit for a long period of time. Uh, God's created some people with dyslexia. So it makes, makes reading uh, more of an uphill battle, which I talked to, to Daniel recently. There's a way that dyslexic people think apparently that is actually a benefit in other ways. So you have a gift from God on one hand that makes certain things that are common to, to the rest of us difficult. Think of the providence of God who decided when we were going to be born? Well, God did. And he decided that all of us would be born almost 2,000 years past the close of the New Testament. So we're 2,000 years removed from the original audiences and more if you go back, back, back into older parts of your Bible. Well, we have to work harder than the original audiences to get at the original context to discover the meaning. That makes clarity require to have clarity, we have to work harder. God decided that he was sovereign over when we would be born. And so that's not really a fault. It's just something that God's determined for us. And sometimes that's a barrier to having the clarity that we desire. Think about your particular family or upbringing. If you were raised in a Christian home under sound doctrine, like the children in this church, then when God saves children in that context, they've got a, a huge head start in understanding scripture and understanding godliness and seeing those things modeled for them in the home and in the church. And so when it comes to understanding scripture, there are hurdles that hopefully those children, like children in our church, won't have to overcome. And God's determined those things. If you weren't brought up in a church like Grace Bible Church, that was God's determination by God's design. He was sovereign over your family and upbringing, what family you would be born into, what context, what culture you would be born into and a part of. God's sovereign over all of those things, and he determined them with no one else's permission. Even the timing of your salvation, to live a long Christian life, it, it aids in, in seeing the, the clarity of Scripture. The longer I've been a Christian, the longer I've been hearing biblical teaching, the longer I've been reading my Bible, that only helps me see Scripture more clearly over time 
if it's going to take me 20 years to understand a passage and God doesn't save me until later in life, but he saves someone else at the age of five, it's going to take both of us 20 years, just for example, to understand a passage. The other person's got a head start since they were saved earlier. That's by God's determination. And even when we finally do understand uh, the the understanding that we have really is ultimately determined by God. When we gain subjective clarity for ourselves, even that is determined by God. Peter is an example of that. He's the first disciple to confess Christ as the Son of God. Jesus tells him it wasn't by flesh and blood that this was revealed. Uh, Thomas, think about after the resurrection, Thomas is the last disciple to actually believe and have, you know, the clarity of of seeing Christ in the flesh. Who determined those things? Well, ultimately God did. He wasn't in the room when Jesus appeared until eight days later, and Jesus reappears. He determined the timing of Thomas' understanding. Jesus even says in Matthew eleven twenty five 25 to 27, he thanks God for hiding these things, these truths about repentance from the wise and understanding, quote unquote, and revealing them to little children, people who humbly believe God. And he says, for such was your gracious will. God determines when and who gets understanding of, of his own truth. These things should be a a great encouragement to us to keep reading your Bible year after year, day after day, week after week. Keep reading the scriptures. Keep sitting under biblical teaching. God is eager that we would see with his clarity so that we can glorify him by obedience and upright living. And so we should keep, keep reading and striving for clarity. One author says, the advocates of this doctrine, the the perspicuity of Scripture, the advocates of this doctrine understood that without a confidence that Scripture is clear, few could be expected to begin or to persevere in reading the Bible. They knew, too, that without it, the public reading of Scripture would soon be swamped by other activities that seemed to generate a more direct connection with God, Yet they argued from their experience that a robust confidence in the clarity of Scripture stimulated interest in the Word of God. It generated expectations of hearing God's address, and it nurtured wholehearted faith in fulsome obedience. He goes on to say, In short, a confession of the clarity of Scripture is an aspect of faith in a generous God who is willing and able to make himself and his purposes known. God has something to say, and he is very good at saying it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for making us know your goodness, for making us, those of us who believe you, for making us even know by experience the joy and fruitfulness and blessing of the clarity of Scripture. By experience, God, so many of us, if we know you, then we know what it's like to hear you clearly. And we are so thankful that we are able to hear you clearly, that you have spoken clearly to us and given us your sufficient word for our own life, for our own godliness. Encourage our hearts, God. Motivate us. Move us. That we would press on in whatever difficulties we encounter in the scriptures, and that we would long to have the clarity, to lay hold of the clarity of your word, all for your glory, so that we can return praise and worship to you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. See you in main service.